Decryption Special is made possible through the continued support of viewers like you. Thank you. Special thanks to these Cryptic Creative Club members. Be sure to leave a rating, comment your thoughts down below, and subscribe to support the channel. Enjoy the show. The role of the creative is to capture, in essence, the nature of the environment around them. Contrary to what one may assume, this isn't for preservation's sake, but rather to simply remind those who have forgotten of what they exist within. As humanity matures, individual human beings will be born into an environment dramatically altered by human influence. I'm sure at some point many of you have thought to yourselves, out of everything we could have done, why did we choose this? No clue. I'm only 20. Regardless, because of the nature of human society, it's absurdly easy for an individual soul to lose itself to what potentially acts as a hell of their race's own design. Furthermore, it may seem as though society's hell-like nature is only exacerbated by the influence of anything and everyone. With so much stacked against humankind, who are we supposed to look to for answers? I don't know much, but I will say what we seek will not come from a scientist nor a politician. Those answers will instead shine true through the bold and daring yet creative rascal. Out of every video I've produced thus far, this one was the most fun I've had researching because the story of Felix the Cat is about as zany as the character himself. As a matter of fact, I was thrust into a heap of trouble simply by attempting to learn who created the character. Felix's story begins with a man named Patrick Peter Sullivan, an Australian-born cartoonist who moved to the United States in 1910. Sullivan was the embodiment of the starved artist, moving countries and changing professions until he was able to land and a job as a New York comic artist's assistant in 1911. In 1914, Sullivan began work at the studio of animation pioneer Raoul Barre, until he was fired on account of being awful at his job. Huh? The video just started and this is where it's at? I know, trust me, it gets much worse. Eventually, Sullivan would go on to open his own animation studio in 1916, aptly named Sullivan Studio. It's here this story diverges towards the man who is commonly accredited as Felix's true creator, Otto Mesmer. American-born, Mesmer came into contact with Sullivan after producing a test film for Universal in 1915 starring his own character, Motor Matt. Ultimately, this film was never released, but it did draw the attention of Sullivan, who recruited Mesmer to join Sullivan's studio upon its opening. Here's where it gets worse. Shortly after opening its doors, Sullivan's studio entered hiatus in 1917 after Sullivan himself was convicted of raping a teenage girl, serving nine months in three days in prison. I know. Coincidentally, Mesmer was also absent from the animation industry at this time as he was drafted to serve in the First World War. The two would not resume their work until 1919, when Sullivan's studio was contracted by Paramount to produce an opening short for one of their upcoming films. What was that film? No idea. I'm here to talk about Felix the Cat. Feline Follies premiered on November 9th, 1919 to the praises of audiences and critics alike, marking the debut of what would be become history's first animated star and one of the most influential pop culture icons of all time. As I stated before, the authorship over Felix the Cat remains in question even to this day. Truthfully, there's a case to be made for Sullivan and Mesmer as Felix's creator respectively and as a collaborative operating unit. In the case of Sullivan, it's important to note he was working with Paramount to produce shorts long before he had even met Mesmer. Many of his supporters claim Felix's true origins lie in one of the shorts Sullivan had produced before Feline Follies, The Tale of Thomas Cat. Thomas Cat is said to have acted as a sort of precursor to Felix, with many of his characteristics serving as the foundations for the cat we know today. However, this short has long since been lost to time, so it's impossible to verify the legitimacy of these claims. And apparently, the details included in a surviving copyright claim for Thomas Cat actually conflict with what we know Felix to be. One of Felix's most defining traits is his black tail, which he transforms and utilizes as a tool whenever necessary. Thomas Cat has no tail, as he lost his during a fight 
fight with a rooster. Regardless of these discrepancies, I do think it's noteworthy Sullivan had a history working with animated cats before Felix. In addition, the lettering within Feline Follies matches Sullivan's handwriting. Sullivan lettered all of his work personally. Moreover, around the cartoon's four minute mark, a kitten can be seen speaking low mum in lieu of low mom. Remember, Sullivan was Australian born, while Mesmer was American. Finally, and most importantly, mannerisms present within Sullivan's work as an artist's assistant from 1911 are present within Feline Follies almost six years later. Interesting stuff. These details are crucial to this controversy, as Mesmer himself claimed to have animated the entirety of Feline Follies within the confines of his own home. In fact, Mesmer claimed total ownership over Felix's creation long after Sullivan had passed away. Regarding the case for Mesmer, the biggest count against Sullivan is the man's vices themselves. For example, Sullivan was a rampant alcoholic and would arrive at his own operation drunk out of his wits. His relationship with alcohol was detrimental to his studio as Sullivan would often fire employees in a drunken haze only to forget come the evening. It's for this reason many of Sullivan's own employees have declared Mesmer Felix's true creator as he himself was rarely ever in a sound state of mind. Then there's also Sullivan's history to take into account. Disregarding his rape conviction and bout with alcoholism, Sullivan's past employers let him go because he was generally incompetent. An instance of that incompetence after Sullivan entered entrepreneurship was his refusal to employ certain talent on the basis of melanin content. Just like our good old buddy Walt, Sullivan was racist and so rooted in his own delusions, I'm sure he'd even look down upon God if he were black. Conversely, Mesmer would continuously display his dedication to the Felix the Cat character and brand, acting as director and lead animator on early Felix cartoons on top of overseeing the development of the Felix comic strip. Despite that, because Mesmer had only claimed his role as Felix's creator long after Sullivan passed, I find it hard to believe the entirety of his account. As a reminder, there's tons of evidence for Sullivan's direct involvement in the production of the first Felix cartoon in contrary to Mesmer's statements. Thus, I believe both men played crucial roles in the conception of this character. I think Sullivan was responsible for building and presenting the foundation for Felix, while Mesmer was responsible for the development of and eventual popularity of the character. I could be wrong about this, it wouldn't be the first time, so I want to reiterate, this is a conclusion I've reached based upon my own research. Now, let's talk about Felix. Felix the Cat is one of the most recognized animated characters in all of film history, and although he started as a simple cartoon, he became a star of very real proportions. For example, this cat was the first of his kind capable of drawing in audiences large enough to fill an entire theater. Throughout the 1920s, Felix dominated pop culture with his short films and comics, but also through merchandising and other forms of distribution. His likeness was so prevalent during this decade, the musicians of the time composed pieces in his honor. Additionally, Felix is among the first cartoon characters inducted into the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And technically the first TV star? In 1928, RCA broadcasted experimental images of a rotating Felix the Cat doll to NBC, the national broadcasting channel. These images would continue to be broadcast for a near decade as RCA worked to fine-tune its picture definition. The official Felix the Cat website describes Felix as a curious, mischievous, and inventive little character with humble beginnings. In effect, it presents Felix as a rascal who relies on his tools to get out of trouble, one of which being his magical bag of tricks. Although serving is one of the most recognizable aspects of his design, Felix's bag of tricks was not an original element of the character, instead being introduced as a part of Joe Oriolo's, Mesmer's assistant, and Casper the Friendly Ghost co-creator's reinterpretation of the character during in the 1950s. As previously stated, Felix's initial debut was in the 1919 short film Feline Follies. To preface, while this cartoon is considered Felix's first outing, the character would not be fully realized until 1924. Feline Follies tells the story of a budding romance between Master Tom, a Miss Kitty White, and the trouble it generates for the former. Who's Master Tom, you ask? Well, that's the man of the hour. Felix is actually referred to as Master Tom in his first two films. 
Holmes. Careful, cool cat, you're Sullivan showing. Now you know what I meant when I said Felix hadn't quite come into himself yet. Master Tom is less anthropomorphic than his second iteration, resembling a proper cat. In addition, Miss Kitty White is the first iteration of another character prominent in the series, Kitty Cat, who has acted as one of Felix's love interests since.
After watching the film for myself, it's clear why Feline Follies was a smashing success. I adore its sense of humor and the personality baked into its animation, sentiments which were felt by those who viewed these cartoons as they once premiered. It's charming watching this lively black cat tread the world we're familiar with in his own two shoes, or on his own four paws in this case. Felix would then go on to star in another film titled Musical Muse, but since that cartoon is considered lost to time, let's shift the discussion to his third outing. The Adventures of Felix the Cat marks the debut of Felix under that name. It's a standard classic American cartoon because of its inclusion of minstrel caricatures. If it weren't already obvious, Felix the Cat is heavily rooted in minstrelsy, and while I'm not personally offended by that, I do believe it's a detail worth discussing.
As you've just watched, Felix Saves the Day tells the story of how Felix assists a Little League team after their star player is imprisoned. First, I love how inventive Sullivan's studio was with the animation of this particular film. Using live footage in lieu of drawn backgrounds is not only charming, but also cost effective. It's a great example of how to work around project limitations in a manner that benefits both the studio and the audience. Second, I love how whimsically written these shorts are. While it may be legitimate to Felix and those around him, in comparison to ours, the logic this world operates on is nonsensical and I'm here for it. As an aside, I'm a huge fan of how this film was edited, since the way it's cut oddly reminds me of a YouTube video. Conclusively, I love this short because I love a finely crafted sense of humor. However, as a black man especially, I could go without the minstrels. During an interview with animation historian John Canemaker, Mesmer detailed how minstrelsy tropes were integral to Felix's design, explaining how those characteristics served to clearly convey the sort of show an audience was to expect while he was on screen. To reiterate, I am not offended by minstrelsy in the least as it's entirely the product of a time past. Furthermore, even if I were presented with a recent example of the practice in play, I'd have a hard time bringing myself to care. Why? It's because I feel it's important I author my own life and those who look like me do the same. Regardless of the foundation the American animation industry was built upon and of the bias held by those who created this character, what once was does not dictate what is yet to come. Over the course of the production of this video, I've heavily familiarized myself with the development of Felix from his infancy to his current iteration. This character has never stood still. Felix adapts as necessary, which is how he's always been able to get himself out of trouble. And considering he's a product of that very industry, I feel American animation is entirely capable of doing the same. The longer you live in the past, the longer you let the present present day slip by. Thus, it's important for the black population, especially for those interested in entering the animation industry, to accept minstrelsy and its ties to the field as is. I wish to see an American animation industry that's more inviting to people of all kinds, and allows for black Americans to find and utilize their voices. I will not root myself in what once was, especially because the industry is already changing for the better. I decide how I view myself and those who exist as I, and we are plenty more dignified than this. Besides, at the very least, I feel I've effectively built a case as to why the very first animated star was in fact black.
As you've just watched, Felix Revolts tells the story of how Felix and his fellow felines unionize after deciding they've had enough of their town's unfair treatment of cats. America's transition from the 19th century into the 20th marked a national rise of workers' unions, organizations dedicated to improving the quality of life for the working class. That's all I'll say about unions though, since this is a video exploring Felix the Cat. <laughs> Many of Felix's earlier adventures are derivative of our own world, specifically America during the 1920s. Workers unions were a hot topic back then, and although I'm not currently engaged with the issue nor lived during the era, I can still appreciate Sullivan Studios' willingness to approach the subject with a sense of humor. It takes a great amount of care and incredible skill to be able to unpack heavy topics with a whimsical air that does no disservices. Existence is a tough pill to swallow, which is why I appreciate character and ideas in the same vein as Sullivan Studios' Felix the Cat. Life should be taken seriously, but it's not at all serious. When one gains the ability to align themselves with the world as is, they'll be able to view existence in all of its strange absurdities. What sense does it make to starve a class of citizens whose roles are integral to maintaining the status quo? What sense does it make to belittle and punish them for simply speaking their truths by fighting for a better way of life? Felix sees this absurdity for what it is because he's aligned himself with the world around him, scheming not only himself, but also his brethren out of hardship into full-blown reverence. Cats exist for a reason, and when the legitimacy of their contributions to the larger experience falls into question, Felix takes a step back to allow for the foolish to live in the absurdity of their own realities. Felix is a rascal through and through, and that's partially because he understands we all need each other. Felix in Hollywood is another noteworthy 1920s cartoon film which portrays Felix in Hollywood in the company of a few of the household names of the era. This cartoon is the embodiment of the American dream, having been made as America's film industry was taking the globe by storm, a time when Hollywood was seen as the place for new beginnings and opportunities. Felix doubles for Darwin sees Felix journey to Africa to discover proof of the relationship between primates and humans after being shown an ad promoting a reward for anyone who could do such. This film premiered in 1924, the same year Felix was given a rounder and cuter redesign by animator Bill Nolan, a far departure from his rougher and blockier previous iteration. This bouncier look greatly complemented Mesmer's animation, which dramatically increased the appeal of Felix as a character and of his films. Felix, all puzzled, depicts Felix's misadventures after he agrees to help his boy finish a crossword puzzle by uncovering a seven-letter word which can only be found in Russia. Spoilers 
years, all Felix finds is trouble. From 1919 to 1921, Paramount would serve as the sole distributor of the Felix the Cat cartoon shorts. In 1922, Margaret J. Winkler, an influential figure in silent film history, would begin distributing the shorts until educational pictures took over in 1925. With the introduction of synchronized sound in film, educational pictures implored Sullivan to transition Felix into a talky cartoon format, to which he refused. This led educational pictures to cease their distribution of Felix films in 1928, and it wasn't until after the release of Disney Pictures' Steamboat Willie cartoon, Sullivan would change his mind. Needless to say, Felix had a rough transition into sound formats that led to the untimely end of his stardom and the house it was built upon. As previously stated, Pat Sullivan was not a competent producer, and so he failed to properly prepare Felix for a transition of any kind. I wouldn't be surprised if he were under the impression Felix's popularity would last forever, and he'd have to do nothing to keep his character relevant to the movie-going population. After his wife's death in 1932, Sullivan unraveled, succumbing to pneumonia and various health issues resulting from his alcoholism upon his death in 1933. With the loss of both Felix the Cat and Pat Sullivan, Sullivan's studio closed its doors for good and faded into obscurity. Attempts to resurrect Felix were made in 1936 with the release of three new Felix cartoons in both color and with sound by Van Buren Studios, but by this time it was far too little, far too late. The goose that laid the golden egg, Neptune Nonsense, and Bold King Cole were disregarded by audiences and critics alike due to their departure from Felix's initial outings in favor of more Disney-like adventures. Ultimately, I'd have to agree since while these cartoons are enjoyable in their own right, they are nothing like the Felix the Cat the world once fell in love with. I'd love to say it was only uphill for Felix from this point onward, but I'd be lying. During the 1920s, Felix was a mischievous and willful character shown doing what he had to survive. In other words, he was a real one working to live his life. Van Buren's 1936 outings introduced the world to an innocent, much less mischievous version of Felix. This pedestrian Felix continued on into the 1950s after the property was completely reimagined by Joe Oriolo for the 1958 Felix television series. Wonderful, wonderful cat. Whenever he gets in a fix, he reaches into his bag of tricks. Felix the cat, the wonderful, wonderful cat. You laugh so much, your sides will ache, your heart will go fit a bad watch. And Felix the wonderful cat. Felix the Cat would go on to run for 260 episodes split over two seasons, produced by famous studios and distributed by Translux. The Oriolo continuity discarded everything that had come before in favor of a new supporting cast, a new world, and new working elements for Felix himself. Before his magic bag, Felix's go-to response for dealing with trouble was the pensive, intentful walk cycle coined the Felix Pace. Beginning here, Felix instead mainly relies on his new magic bag of tricks, which can conjure whatever he needs to get out of a pinch. In truth, I feel Felix's magic bag is the only aspect of Oriolo's continuity that falls in line with what came before. Felix is a character built upon intently crafted humor, so it shouldn't come as a shock that a decent majority of the jokes in his older cartoons are simple play on words. Considering this, Oriolo is a genius for introducing a major new working element that falls in line with all of Felix's iterations, and acts as a play on words itself. Unfortunately, that is where my praise for his standalone Felix work ends. I do not like the Felix the Cat show because it's boring and it's for babies, and I don't like it because it's boring and for babies. And from up here, I can keep an eye on him. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a thing to do, I guess. <laughs> Very good, very good. He's in my control. I know, Felix is so much more than a simple children's cartoon character, and so most of what Joe Oriello developed failed to strike a chord with me. It's all too nice and campy. A Felix the Cat movie rooted in this continuity was released to home video in August of 1991, and apparently that film was so babyish and boring in nature that the very people who worked on the project abandoned it shortly after its release. Moving on. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> Finally, after all that time, the king of animation returns. Exploring the twisted tales of Felix the Cat was the most fun I had during the production of this video. This series is just delightful. Produced by Film Roman, the animation studio responsible for Garfield and Friends and Dan Versus, the twisted tales of Felix the Cat ran from 1995 to 1997, with 21 episodes split across two seasons. Season 1 being the first 13, and season 2 the latter 8. Episodes are divided into smaller segments, there being 58 in total. As an aside, Twisted Tales lower episode count could be the result of its supposed high production costs, with the series being one of the most expensive film Romans ever produced. Thankfully, Twisted Tales falls more in line with the 1920s Sullivan Mesmer cartoons, although some elements from the Oriolo continuity are still present. The first episode's first segment, Guardian Idiot, sees Felix meet his guardian angel after he's tricked by a butcher who aims to slaughter and serve him in his restaurant. Instead of saving Felix from the trouble he had already gotten into, his angel lands him in more precarious situations until finally freeing him from the butcher who started all that nonsense in the first place. Space Time Twister is an exceptionally cool segment depicting the crazy psychedelic adventure Felix goes on after boarding the wrong subway train. The final segment, Don't String Me Along, sees Felix's world thrust into chaos when he pulls at a loose outline while trying to clean his house. I wouldn't be surprised if these three segments alone were why this show was so expensive to produce. The Twisted Tales of Felix the Cat is the most imaginative, inventive, and intentful cartoon series I have ever watched in my entire life. Well-crafted humor could be regarded as many things, however, I would define it as exactly that. Imaginative, inventive, and very intentful. Every aspect of this production's design, from its animation, to its writing, and even to its music, was efficacious in serving Felix the Cat. This is Felix the Cat, and I am here for it. As a matter of fact, from this point onward, the show only gets better as my favorite episode is just its second. Specifically, the opening two-parter, The Sludge King. The first segment opens up with Felix peddling for cash on the corner, and with what's perhaps my favorite joke in all of Felix history. Felix's world is so cutthroat he has to fight with his own shadow to simply make a living. Sad. Anyway, this episode is the first appearance of Felix's magic bag in Twisted Tales, and so I wanted to take some time to reiterate how I feel it is one of the few aspects of Oriolo's continuity that truly builds upon the character. First, Felix has always been a nomad traversing life however he may please, and so a handbag is the perfect companion element to his character's larger design. Second, it could be said the only possession one can hold on to during a lifetime is their own baggage, and it's through his learned experiences Felix is able to navigate his way out of trouble as efficiently as possible. Felix's bag is appropriate in both a literal and metaphorical sense, and so I can only think to describe it as pure genius. We're then introduced to Candy Kitty, Felix's primary love interest in Twisted Tales. Candy Kitty is total eye candy for Felix the Cat, and so after he's dealt with his shadow, <laughs> he heads off to meet her in the building she just walked into. After consulting the brothers out front, Felix heads into the studio in search of Miss Kitty. Obviously, I could not continue without expressing my elation for the cheeky designation of an animation studio is this segment setting. This is simply humorous, bro. No other way to put it. Yeah? Thanks, pal. I know a little about animation. Maybe I can impress Dollface a little. As a result, most of the jokes within this episode's first segment are jabs at the animation industry itself, and you can tell the Twisted Tales crew had a lot of fun with these in particular. My favorite has to be Felix's general indifference towards the studio's 3D animation department. Egad, that is the all-time funniest gag I've ever animated. <laughs> Ooh, I better go change my pants. What a geek. 1995 to 1997 is within the time frame of Pixar's rise to fame, and it's nice to see a more recent Felix production taking cues from real-world events. Eventually, Felix meets up with his best friend Roscoe, who's at the studio to have lunch with Kitty, who also happens to be his sister. Ah, 
I'm hungry. Ah, uh, you're always hungry. Come on, sit down, and I'll tell you about this kitty I'm bird dogging. Ooh. Man, what a woman. Eyes like pies. <laughs> Pie eyes. I love this show. Felix's excitement at finally meeting Kitty startles Roscoe, which causes him to drop his donut. He wanders in pursuit of the stray pastry until it falls into a sewer grate, to which he stops to look down, to which he's pulled into himself. The segment ends with Felix diving in to save his friend. The second part of Sludge King opens with Felix scouring the sewers in search of Roscoe. Dude, it's a special guest appearance. This show is super epic, but Mickey Mouse, not so much. After a while, Felix is plucked by his tail into the kingdom of these hody howdy sludge guys. These dudes are my favorite because half of their vocabulary is just made up words, and it's so funny. Felix is reunited with Roscoe after he's imprisoned by the Sludge King, who declares he'll eat both felines for dinner and dessert. Now engaged in some real trouble, Felix acts upon his rascal tendencies by reaching into the foreground and out of the television screen to manually rewind the program using the set's remote. I don't even need to explain why this is brilliant because you already know it is. I don't think so, bud. It must be one of those interactive deals. He watches the same 3D animation from the first segment to completion in order to see how he outsmarts the Sludge King. When back at the sewers, Felix tricks the Sludge King into drinking excessive amounts of sewer grog, then uses his magic bag to conjure up the finest portable toilet so his majesty doesn't wet his tidy whities He turns into Sonic, grabs Roscoe, and then they both ride Felix's magic bag the hell out of Dodge. Having saved the day, Felix finally gets some one-on-one -on -one time with Kitty, who who is actually dating that geeky 3D animation dweeb from the episode's opening segment. We know Felix though, and nothing ever seems to really get him down. Truthfully, I could go on for hours about how much I adore the twisted tales of Felix the Cat. However, this video is already long enough, so I'll end this section by simply saying, I truly do believe this is one of the greatest cartoons in all of human history. It is imperative it be preserved for the enjoyment of future generations. Unfortunately, without twisted tales, those who come after us will only be left with baby Felixu. Oh boy, the pendant I wanted to give Kitty is already Kitty's. I just can't figure girls out. Ugh. After producing this video, I cannot think of any word more fitting to describe the tale of Felix the Cat besides Twisted. Catapulted into fame and fortune from the unlikeliest of places, then thrust into the depths of obscurity, Felix is enigmatic like no other. Regardless of who came after and what lies next, ain't nobody done it like Felix the Cat. Nobody. I'd like to reiterate, as I've displayed on the channel before, I am not a fickle man. I know exactly what I like and why I like it. Felix the Cat and characters in the same vein resonate with me because they're representative of humankind as we were intended. Regardless of the traits that differentiate us, at the end of the day, the reason we are all here living on Earth is because we were built to live. We were built with the intention of living fully realized lives, freed from the shackles of subconscious. We were built to exist as we are, as we always have been, and as we always will be. Individuals in the company of all. A wise man named Alan Watts once said, Before we decide to either save the planet or destroy it, we must pause for a moment of silence. Ironically, what's humorous about silence is once you find yourself engaged with it, you'll come to realize it's truly the loudest of all. Heaven is a very real place. And when I watch Felix, I cannot help but be reminded of that. I do not know much, but I do know I am here for a reason. I am here because I have something to say. And while I cannot fully articulate upon that in which I've come into contact with, I will continue to try because that is what I was born to do. I do not know much, but I do know you are here for a reason. I cannot tell you which role you were designed for because you 
are its very nature. Please, I ask you to show me what you're made of because if not you, then who else? Eternity is now because it's always been. You hold the key to unlocking the door that leads you into today. Be bold and step into the present. In poetic manner, it's only right I end this escapade into the world of the rascal with what generated all this nonsense for myself. Again, human language is vast and bountiful, but also absurdly limited. I do not feel there exists a word that effectively encompasses a state of being similar to that of consciousness, and so I've conceived one. Omnimagnitude, a state of being in which an abstract is so rich in nature it cannot be contained, thus becoming virtually incomprehensible. Imagination, inventiveness, intentfulness. Well-crafted humor lies at the core of this channel and at the core of any of my work outside it. Life should be taken seriously, but it is not at all serious. Felix the Cat provided the world with the whimsical air of humor it needed at the time, which is why I reckon he arrived when he did. As my work on the monocryptic character and the larger cryptic brand continues, I'm only made more aware of humankind's need for good-natured entertainment, and so I will continue to provide it. However, if the production timeline for this project was any indicator, it is by no means easy producing said entertainment. As such, I would like to implore you all to support the channel by joining the Cryptic Creative Club. Cryptic Creative Club was conceived in response to an epidemic our communities have been suffering from, the suppression of creativity. My life until now has been anything but easy, and I could not imagine living through my past experiences if I were unable to express myself. Although I was lucky enough to provide myself with a creative outlet, outlet and the healthy environment to cultivate it, I acknowledge many of those who exist as I have not and may not be given the opportunity to do the same. In addition to granting access to exclusive content and early access to upcoming content, Cryptic Creative Club provides a private space dedicated to providing the tools to cultivate a healthy practice. There are channels for connecting you with resources, to keep you in touch with your creativity, for sharing and fine-tuning your own creative practice, and finally general social spaces for connecting with like-minded individuals. If you want to be an animator, or a game designer, or even a musician, it's very possible if you start now. You will only live as you are once, so whatever you do, do not let time simply pass you by. Take action. By joining Cryptic Creative Club, you'd be helping me out tremendously, but more importantly, you'd be helping yourself. Tap into your boundless creativity with Cryptic Creative Club, available via YouTube channel memberships and now on Patreon, only on the Monocryptic YouTube channel.